This is what happens when you work to change things. And first they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. I just finished the best business book since Shoe Dog, Phil Knight's incredible autobiography. This one's called Bad Bloods by John Carreyu, and it's about the sordid tale of Theranos, the alleged blood diagnostic company, and it's charismatic and culpable founder, Elizabeth Holmes. This book reads like a novel about greed, about chicanery, and ultimately about tragedy. Tragedy for what it did to the people who used the device. I promise you that you will hate almost everyone connected with this company and think they should belong in jail when you're through reading this remarkable book, written by the man who first exposed the giant con, John Carreyu, Pulitzer Prize winner reporter from the Wall Street Journal. That's why I was thrilled that he dropped by the set to talk about his riveting expose that you should read between now and Labor Day. Take a look. John, anyone who read Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley startup, could they still believe that she is anything but crazy? Well, I, I think people are in the right to, to you know, ask and, and question what's going on in her mind and what has been going on in her mind for 15 years. Um, I, I like to say that this is different from a Bernie Madoff type of fraud in that she dropped out of Stanford really wanting to be an entrepreneur and her idol was Steve Jobs and she idolized Apple. She w really wanted to replicate that success story. And I don't believe that she dropped out with this notion that she was going to pull a long con and defraud investors. But unfortunately, over the years, she ran into setbacks with this vision of a blood testing device she was trying to pursue. And instead of admitting those setbacks and, and uh, you know, admitting to her investors where she was with the progress, she, she lied and the lies got bigger and bigger and eventually the lies got so big relative to reality that it became a, a pretty massive fraud. Well, John, there's two skeins of this book and I just love it. One is how all these people were fooled, but the other I want to put first, and you have a quote of someone screaming in the audience at one point, you hurt people. This woman really hurt people, didn't she? Well, I mean, one of the, the most outrageous things about this Theranos scandal is the fact that the company went live with its finger stick tests in Walgreens stores in Northern California and Arizona five years ago in the fall of 2013 and knew the two people at the top, Elizabeth Holmes and her boyfriend, Sonny Balwani, knew very well that the, the tests were unreliable. For one thing, the, the Theranos machine only handled several of the tests, a handful of the tests, and most of the tests were being done on third-party commercial analyzers that they'd modified and hacked to uh, adapt them to small samples. And one of the things they did was they diluted the small droplets of blood to make the volume bigger to accommodate uh, these, these commercial machines. And that, of course, introduced all sorts of room for error. And, and in the end, this company had to, to void nearly a million blood test results. Who knows what could have happened? Now, on June 15th, uh, she was indicted by the federal government. And when I read the book, I felt that you could make a very compelling case right from the book that she did commit fraud. And if you think fraud should lead to jail time, that she should be in jail. Is that a reasonable presumption? I mean, I think this did metastasize into a fraud, especially once she and, and Sonny Balwani, her boyfriend and number two right. at the company, made the fateful decision to go live with these finger stick right. tests in the fall of 2013. Aside from, from endangering the public health, which they did by doing that, right. the, thing, the key thing to remember about that decision is the company was running out of money then. And so by going live with the technology, they were able to solicit new funding to go to right. people like Rupert Murdoch, who, by the way, owns my newspaper, right. and other investors such as the Walton's, Walton Hares, and say to them, look, obviously, we're for real. Obviously, I've succeeded in inventing what, I, what I've told you I've invented because we've gone live with the technology. We're offering these finger stick blood tests in stores in two states, so obviously, it must be real. And that's how she was able to raise the last $700 million in funding is, is by using uh, the fact that they had gone live in the stores to get more money. Well, there's another element through the book that I love, this insular nature of what basically is a Stanford contingent. And you've got some, I regard, genuine villains, including people I revered. George Schultz is a villain in the story. David Boyce, the attorney, is a villain in the story. I have to tell you, General Mattis is a villain in the story. 
Well, th these are people, I mean, two of them, Mattis and Schultz, were on the board of Theranos, and uh, I agree with you, they don't come off looking good Oof. in the story. Um, I don't think they realized that uh, Theranos was doing most of the blood tests on these hacked commercial machines. Um, in fact, I've seen uh, documentation recently from the, the SEC inquiry uh, that, that pretty much shows they had no idea. And so she was lying to her board as well. Okay. I believe that even, even David Boys, whose associates certainly don't come off looking good no. in the book, after what they did with Tyler Schultz, George Schultz's grandson, right. whom they ambushed at one point in his own grandfather's house, even David Boys, I don't think, knew that out of 250 blood tests on the menu, you had more than 240 that were being done on hacked commercial analyzers. Okay, well, that's, um, we're going to give them that. But I don't know what to give to, uh, to Mr. Bird, who at that point was running Safeway, uh, it, it, so desperate for growth, to Walgreens, a fearful that CVS was going to get this. Right. Blinders in these people, major business people. Right. One of the most incredible parts of this story is that Walgreens actually hired a laboratory specialist, a, a consultant, and brought him in-house in 2010 and 2011, a guy by the name of Kevin Hunter. And he was hired to look after their interests and to kick the tires and to do diligence on Theranos, which he proceeded to do. He went out to Palo Alto several times to, to see the company's headquarters, meet with Sonny and Elizabeth. He was also in, in uh, these video uh, conference calls they had every week. And he started smelling a rat in late 2010. And he tried to alert Walgreens to, to the fact that this you know, could become a major fiasco. And the executives at Walgreens just ignored him. They, they were so afraid that Theranos would turn around and strike a deal with their rival, their arch rival, CVS, that they just ignored their own in-house consultant. Okay, now there is an, an element of Jonestown here. When I was a reporter, I covered Jonestown and what happened. And for the most part, the people who drank the Kool-Aid were not that educated and not that worldly. How could this Connors convince so many brilliant people? So many brilliant, is it the blacks? Is it the black shirt? Is it the, the deep voice? Is it the Steve Jobs? I mean, these were made, these are brilliant thinkers and they were all conned. Right. And I think the answer to that is she's uh, a very smart woman, uh, very charismatic. Um, one aspect of her uh, is that she really did believe in her vision. She really did believe right. that creating this machine that would be able to run every test known to man off just a pinprick of blood, that that would really be good for society right. and that it would do good. And so I think she has this condition called moral, moral, sorry, no, noble cause corruption, which is that she ultimately believed that what she was going to achieve when she got there was going to be a good thing for humanity. And therefore, every lie and every corner she cut along the way was justified. Well, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is astounding is this, this puppeteer, Sonny. I don't think, it seems like people didn't even know he was until you wrote the book. Right. I mean, uh, if you if you try to look him up on the web, you can't even find a, a photo of him. Um, he's had I think he's had the Internet scrubbed. But uh, to people who had been at Theranos from the beginning, and there are a few employees who did manage to, to escape the, the massive purges that went on there all the time. They knew that that he was uh, her longtime boyfriend. Uh, they essentially started uh, living together in 2005 in a condo he owned in, in Palo Alto for the first five years or so of the company, he was uh, behind the scenes. He didn't actually work there. And then in 2009, he joins. And at that point, this, this culture of fear and paranoia, yeah, constant it. turnover, all that goes into overdrive. And from that point forward, they really run this company as a couple, and they perpetrate this fraud as a couple. All right, one last question. What is her next or last act? And is black the new orange? Could this woman end up in prison? Well, she's facing 11 counts of wire fraud. Um, the, the indictment by the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco describes two schemes, one to defraud investors of more than $700 million, and the other to defraud uh, doctors and patients and, and make them believe uh, they were uh, using accurate and, and innovative technology. And, you know, the, the potential sentence is, if she's convicted by a jury, is 20 years behind bars. Um, recently, uh, the, the prosecution has handed over all the evidence as part of uh, the discovery in the criminal case, and it's contained in a two-terabyte hard drive. 
So, I mean, that, that's more storage than you have on your average computer that you buy na nowadays. Well, so that, that gives you an Not idea. a nanotainer. Bigger than a nanotainer. It's much, much, much bigger than well, a nanotainer. Well, I want to congratulate John Curry. He's the Wall Street Journal's investigative reporter, author of Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in the Silicon Valley Startup. I knew the whole story. It read like a fast-paced novel. You must read this book. Mad Money's back after the break. Booyah! Jim Cramer here from Mad Money. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube. Click here to subscribe and get the jump on my exclusives with CEOs, plus market news, investing advice, and a whole lot more.